Now I want to circle back. I want to circle back a little bit to um, the slavery question, which is which is like the central aspect of your book, after all, and the, the different forms of it. So, eventually, at the end of the Civil War, we get the Thirteenth Amendment, which ends slavery in the United States, but does allow for like what well, what eventually becomes convict lease systems in the Southern states. But per se, we don't have slavery in the West, but we do have sort of slavery in the West. <laughs> yeah, so, we coerced labor regimes survived the 13th Amendment. Um, it's not the sort of clean end date to the history of American slavery that you know maybe our high school textbooks tell us. Um, yeah. And uh, some people have been doing some really good work on the subject. Um, uh, landholders managed to hold on to their peon laborers for decades after the passage of the 13th Amendment. And they do so in sort of flying in the face of um, an anti-peonage statute that the Republican Party passes after mm -hmm. the war as part of their campaign against slavery in its various shapes and forms. Um, but because uh, New Mexico is, you know, a territory because it's far from centers of federal power, because unlike the Confederate, the former Confederate states, it's not under military occupation. Um, these landholders are able to retain their, their unfree laborers. Um, you know, some of them do get emancipated, but a lot of them don't. And that applies both to the Latino as well as the native. Um, yeah, a, a lot of these peon laborers were, um, they had mixed ancestry. Mm -hmm. um, they were or mestizo workers, um, uh, basically in, indebted peasants. Right. And <clears throat> that sort of 